<laughs> good morning. We've got the red light of recording. We are good to go. Um, I got to say again, it really is a pleasure uh, to be here this morning. It's a joy to partake of the fellowship of the saints and and uh, this topic, well, this topic, this book of Philippians, as we've been talking about for many weeks and will continue, apparently for twice as many as we've already been, because uh, we're only in chapter two. Uh, it's it, talking about this idea of servitude and, and attitude, and it's so nice to have a place like this that's a home away from home. You know, and, and, and it's true for those that are out there that really those churches out there that that seek the Lord. You can just tell when you walk in the room, it feels like family. And that's the amazing joy we have with that unity of the Holy Spirit in all those that believe. Uh, this morning we're going to continue looking at Philippians chapter 2. If you would like to follow along, I'll be beginning reading in verse 12. Uh, we'll be moving on some today. Now, why bother even saying anything like that? I never know how far I'll get. I read a lot of notes, and then sometimes I don't follow them. So as you're finding your way to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, I'll open us again in a, another word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, I'm so grateful to be here. I'm thankful for what you've done for us through Jesus Christ, that joy in Jesus Christ that can never be taken from us, that we, we can rejoice always, as you say, because we cannot be separated from your love through Jesus Christ. What a joy it is, Lord, the moment that we trust sincerely in your shed blood is tamed for our sins. That your Holy Spirit places us into Christ, sealing us there, guaranteeing our heavenly <clears throat> position. Thank you so much for that. Making us complete in Christ, all trespasses forgiven. And I pray, Lord, as we continue studying this book of Philippians, that, that we... We embrace our identity in Christ so much that we act as we should. We have the attitude of Christ as we read in Philippians chapter 2 and live out a life as a child of light rather than a child of darkness. So may we continue to do that. May we mature in our faith wherever we're at representing you well as your ambassadors, holding forth the word of life, that message of reconciliation. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. The last few weeks, without my intention, have turned into quite the apologetic lesson. But from time to time, I think it's worth going back and looking at the timeline of God. I was tempted to say the two major Gospels of God because there are many Gospels in our Bible, many good newses, if you will. But the two that really stand out are the ones that we've talked about in the last three or four weeks. And I had to go there because of what we read here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And it's those two verses that I had to point out over several weeks how we don't have to do any works to have salvation. Okay? And that's a big confusion in Christianity today, and especially the world, but we shouldn't be surprised when an unbeliever says, see what you have to do, or something like that. Uh, these things are spiritually discerned. God's Word is spiritually discerned. And as we've looked in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we read that we have the mind of Christ, and we can discern such things. And uh, last, I don't know, one of these last weeks, I know I've been to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, that says that the Word of God works effectually in them that believe. Okay? And it brings us into that maturation in Christ, that we grow in Christ and we're no longer babes in Christ. And we've talked about the church in Corinth and in Galatia, how those two 
uh, epistles, and of course Galatia is the region, there's many churches within that region of the old Roman province of Galatia, uh, that they were, they were believing another gospel, that was the, the error of the churches in Galatia, or the Corinthian church, which, like we would say today, accepted the fire insurance and just lived their lives anyway. And they just, they accepted the grace of God. Yeah, that sounds great. And let's go party and do all sorts of debauchery and stuff. Because when you read the epistle to Corinth in 1 Corinthians, he outright calls them babes in Christ. You're acting like little children. Uh, and he encourages them to grow. It's like, I, I got to keep feeding you the milk. You're not even ready for the meat yet. And you get a similar language even in the book of Hebrews. It talks about that as well. <clears throat> but the, the idea in all of these epistles really is that you see this desire for maturation in the word of truth to come to that full understanding of the truth, which is the will of God, right? 1 Timothy 2, 4. And, and when, we, when we... I gotta go to Galatians again. Okay, just make sure you got at least one finger, a marker here, and, and turn to Galatians chapter 2. I'll get there in a moment. I'm just wrestling with my thoughts in my head. But when we read a word here, or a verse here in Philippians 2, 12, that says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, uh, there were works that were required under the law as part of that law covenant. And we've gone over a lot of the scriptures to show that there's a difference of under law versus under grace. And in the book of Romans, it has a specific verse that says, for you're not under law, but under grace. It's chapter 6, verse 14. Okay, so what happened? What changed? How did that change? When did that change? And so we had looked in the book of Galatians, and chapter 2 correlates with Acts 15. If you want to look at two different perspectives of, this, of the same event, Paul, Barnabas, Titus go up to Jerusalem. Paul says here in... Verse, where do you say it by revelation? Verse 2. Thank you. Verse 2. I don't know why I couldn't see it. Uh, well, let's just start in verse 1. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, I went up by revelation. I don't know why my eyes couldn't see that. I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. And even with that much, those few words, it says volumes. Mm -hmm. And I've gone over and shown this many times before, and I have no problem doing it again. But when you read through the book of Acts and just let it say what it says, continuing from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Jesus' earthly ministry when he's upon the earth in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us, right? He was born of a woman born under the law, it says in Galatians, and that's what we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When the rich young ruler comes up to ask him, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What was Jesus' response? He doesn't say, believe that my blood will cover all of your sins. He doesn't say that, but he says, thou shalt not kill, honor thy father and mother. He goes through some things of the law, and then the rich young ruler responds with all these things have I kept since my youth. What lack I yet? Just makes me think about what was going on in his head. He must have had some sort of empty feeling. But there's something more. There's got to be more than just these works. There is. <laughs> right? It's that faith portion. Uh, and so Jesus told him, sell all that you've got. Right? And even in that passage, Jesus loved him. He knew what the stumbling block was. Sell all that you have. Then come follow me. And instead of saying, okay, he went away crying. So we know where his heart was, and we can sympathize with that, because I'm sure in our lives we didn't want to give something up, at least one thing. <laughs> but in essence, like, we realize the value of it is temporary. And we have things in our life for only a certain time. Um, but I, I'm sorry to digress a little bit. But under Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's under law. This is still Old Testament stuff. Even though Jesus said in that last supper, this is my blood of the new covenant, he is ratifying it and he's signing that agreement, if you will, that contract, and it will come to fruition at a later date. And that later date would be, in our Bibles, Revelation 20. He comes back, he establishes that kingdom, he 
puts Israel under the rod, Ezekiel 20, and separates them, those that were true Israelites, and that true Israelites defined Romans 2, right? The end of Romans 2, how he is seeking glory not of men but of God, and circumcision is of the heart, not of the flesh, right? even though that was required as well. Okay. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all under law, and here comes that New Testament, New Covenant, and all of that has been prophesied, to borrow a phrase from the Bible, since the world began. Okay, all of these things were leading up to that moment. Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Three very important words. Of the kingdom. Ask yourself, which kingdom? It's that same kingdom promised to Israel, your promised land where Messiah the, it will sit on the throne of David. That throne is to be established forever. Uh, first, second Samuel 7? First Samuel 7? Second Samuel 7. Is the Davidic covenant. He says that throne will be established forever. And there's all sorts of scriptures, we would never have enough time to go through them all in one morning session, that show that essentially Jesus, the Messiah, is going to sit on that throne and rule Israel, Psalm 2, with the rod of iron. <clears throat> and uh, Israel will be the kingdom of priests. It will be that holy nation that was told them, if you do this, then that's who you will be and back in Exodus 19, that if-then principle. So you'll hear me say that uh, as well, because there were promises based on obedience. And we can't ignore that. It's, it's all over the place. Uh, especially what... I really am digressing. What Jesus said after what most call the Lord's play, prayer. Prayer? The Lord's prayer. And I'd actually like to read it. If you want to turn to Matthew 6, I really will finish Galatians 2 at some point this morning. But in Matthew 6, right, we can't escape what Jesus says here after the very familiar verses that uh, most call the Lord's Prayer. Now let's pick it up in verse 13. So the end of that, when Jesus teaches them how to pray, and he says, after this manner pray, he doesn't say repeat this every week, because right before that he says, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. And so we don't have to repeat this prayer. Uh, He's just saying in this manner. But in verse 13, it says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Or if you look at the Greek, the evil one. Uh, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Is that how we operate today? Is my forgiveness based on my ability to forgive? Thank you, God, that is not. <laughs> uh, we have a much different verse in Ephesians 4, verse 32. If you don't, wouldn't mind glancing at that a moment, we can leave Matthew behind. I'll eventually, again, get back to uh, Galatians. But first, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, 32 Paul says, Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And how much had God forgiven us? Well, it's very clearly written in Colossians chapter 2 and verse. Verse 10 is always the one I think of. But verse 13, at the very end of that, well, I'll just read the whole thing. Verse 13, he says, You being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together or made alive together with him, with Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses. So because of our completeness, chapter or verse 10 says you're complete in Christ, after our completeness, now we forgive others in that same manner. Okay? It's not based on our forgiveness that we receive it. We already have it in Christ. That's good news. We don't have to do those works. Okay, so we're seeing some differences of law versus grace. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of that's under law. Acts chapters 1 through 8 is also all under law. Even Peter's famous Acts 2 speech. Okay, it's all under law stuff. He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Repent and be baptized. You shall be, or, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, and then we get to uh, Acts 9. Now Saul of Tarsus is saved on the road to Damascus. Uh, you can. I didn't mean to go into this again, 
But when you look at uh, Acts 9, uh, correlating with Acts 22 and 26, Paul's three times he recounts this encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Uh, in there, he said, Jesus says to Paul, you are my chosen vessel unto the Gentiles. And you think, well, wait a minute, what was Peter saying? Who was he talking to? And really think about that, because Acts 2, it's the day of Pentecost, one of three feasts that all men of Israel are required to be in Jerusalem. So when it says there are devout Jews from every nation under heaven, yeah, that's part of the requirement. If they're devout, if they're going to follow the law, they will be in Jerusalem for that feast day. And so he's preaching to Jews. Okay? That's what he's doing. And in Acts chapter 10, hopefully that becomes obvious when Cornelius, that whole account comes up. Because Peter talks about eating according to the law, what we understand today as kosher. Okay? Eating according to the law is, I have not, never let any unclean thing into my mouth. Three times, right? That vessel or that, that sheet with all the manner of food on it gets let down. Three times he sees that vision. And he's trying to figure out what's going on. Then Cornelius' men come, and they ask for Peter, and the Holy Spirit tells Peter, go with them, doubting nothing. And so Peter goes with them, and he goes unto Cornelius, who is a Gentile. And when he gets there, he says, you know how it is unlawful for a Jew to come unto one of another nation. But I have come because the Holy Spirit told me to go, doubting nothing. Now, what is it that you have sent me for? Something like that. Hopefully you got that quote right. But it's chapter 10, verse 20, something. Okay. So Peter right there confesses, I am not willingly coming to the Jew, Gentiles. Okay? We, we can't ignore these verses in there. But then the Holy Spirit comes upon Cornelius and his family. He gathered everybody he could for this speech, right? And they all receive the gift of the Holy Spirit before any water baptism takes place. And Peter was really confused. When you read after this, uh, who, what, what hinders them to be baptized? Uh, let's get some water, I guess. Now, you can kind of see his confusion in all of this. And then the, those of the circumcision see that and, like, whoa, the Holy Spirit come on the Gentiles also? It was a shocking thing. And we're in Acts 10. Okay, we're at least a year or more into uh, the, the time difference between when Jesus ascended up into heaven to that point. Okay? And, and when they come back to the circumcision, the brothers of the circumcision, like it says there in chapter 11, they're like, are you nuts? You went to a Gentile, right? They, they did not like it. They contended with him. And then Peter tells them the whole story. And they're like, whoa, that's crazy, right? And so they weren't willingly going to the Gentiles. That's my point. And Jesus sends Paul specifically to the Gentiles. And now I think that can bring us back to Galatians chapter 2. So Paul went with his gospel that he preaches unto the Gentiles and Galatians chapter 2, verse 2, that's what he says. It's my gospel, Paul says those, those words also, or the dispensation committed to me. And he's not being egotistical like some say. Some don't like Paul, think he's full of himself. He's not doing that. He says, I magnify my office. Right? I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. I am least than, less than the least of all saints. That's what he talks about himself. But he magnifies that office. How great and glorious is this, the gospel of the grace of God. And this is really good news. So in verse 2 of Galatians 2, he says he, he spoke privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that should throw red flags up too. Why not? It's required in the law. And that was actually the contention going about in the, the region of Galatia. Because some, well, I'll let God say it. Verse 4. That because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. They were preaching, oh, you, you're, you're in Christ, you believe in Christ, now you have to get circumcised. Otherwise it doesn't count. Right? I, I'm putting words in their mouth, but essentially that's what they're saying. You have to be circumcised if you're really saved. And so he's saying that they wanted to bring us into bondage. Verse 5 says, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might be continue with you. We didn't give in to that. Verse 6 says, But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man his person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrary wise. So you can imagine the whole back and forth that they would have had with Paul, Titus, Barnabas, and Peter, James, John, and the others. I'm naming them because they're named here. 
about this whole idea of do you have to be circumcised? Do you not have to be circumcised? And you can imagine how Peter and Paul were talking to each other because Jesus sent them both. Okay? In verse 7, it says, Contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Who's the he here? It's Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus sent them both. But look at what verse 9 says. When James, Cephas, that's Peter again, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen, which is to say the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. Okay, so this is that right hands of fellowship. Yes, God is working through you. Jesus sent Paul. That's why we don't have our kingdom yet. That's what 2 Peter 3 says. Some count men, or slackness, ah, man, see, I'd have to go there so I don't butcher trying to quote those verses again. But it, that's the infamous verse of a day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Simile. It's not literal. As. So time is a totally different meaning for God. I like to say that God created time for us. You look at Genesis, the book of Genesis, day four, when he created the sun, the moon, and the stars, they were for times and seasons, days, months, and years. That's what they're for. Okay, so God created time for us. He existed out of that. He's the one that started it. Okay, so it, it's, it's, that's what that verse is getting at, not literally that we've got to live through uh, 7,000 years, although that is a nice thing to think about. I don't want to bank on in the year 6,000, because hardly anyone knows when that year is anyway. That's when the millennial kingdom will start. For 1,000 years, that's the restful period. Day 7, God rested. Okay, I, I get the argument. I get it. But again, God created this time. I'm just going to let him do what he's going to do. I'm not going to say he has to focus on that, and I'm not going to say a day is 1,000 years. There's a very significant difference with that one vowel. Okay? He says, as 1,000 years. Okay, calm down. <laughs> I hear that a lot lately, so that's, that was my thing this week. Uh, <laughs> but look really carefully in verse 9. Now, I've, I've shown the two separate Gospels in verse 7 and defined what they are. Right? The Gospel of the circumcision, Israel's going to have their kingdom. Jesus will rule and reign, millennial kingdom. It's going to be awesome. Okay? It's really good news. I can hardly wait for that to take place. But there's also this Gospel of the uncircumcision. And what is that? That's what Paul writes about. And you're only going to find it in Romans through Philemon. Okay? But look at verse 9 again. When James, Peter, and John gave the right hands of fellowship, and down there it says they. Who's the they? James, Peter, and John. They're going to preach to the circumcision. Well, hopefully that helps us understand when you read First and Second Peter and First, Second, Third John and Revelation, because John wrote that too. That's to the circumcision. Okay? And hopefully this helps clear up a lot of confusion within, uh, well, I can't even say within Christianity. Hopefully this helps clear up confusion in the Bible, period. Because it's clearly divided. <laughs> and we've got to rightly divide the word of truth. Because uh, not everything we have to take, oh, that's me, got to do it. Because the sad reality is a lot of people will latch on to every single blessing in there and just reject all the cursings, right? But if you're going to go on to the law, like he says here, you know, you got to follow it all, because by the time you get to Galatians 5, when he calls them foolish, and constantly in chapter 3, he proves how uh, the law was the schoolmaster to bring us unto this faith now, in, in chapter 3 and 4. So then by the time you get to chapter 5, he says, Stand fast, therefore, this is verse 1, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, behold I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he is the debtor to do the whole law. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. you got to do it all, which is not even possible because there's no temple, there's no sacrificial system. Right? You can't even do it. But that's what we would do, and this brings me back to wanting to preach on Romans 9 and 10, which I have no intention of doing this morning, uh, of how they seek righteousness, as it were, by the works of the law and not by faith. For Christ is the end of of law unto righteousness for everyone that believeth. Right? That's Romans 10. Okay? So we don't need to keep any works of the law. We are completely free to do whatever we want in Christ. That's what Scripture does say. We, uh, 
All things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. So there is an expected way that we ought to behave. And that brings us back around to Philippians 2. It's almost like I planned that. (laughs) Philippians 2, verse 12, when he talks about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now just live it out. This is who you are in Christ now. That was then. We are in this but now time frame on God's timeline where God did away with all sin through Christ on the cross. His blood paid for every trespass. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us, right? While we were yet without strength, Romans 5 says. And in that show of love, now live that out. Because he did that for you, Philippians 2, just before that, this was his attitude. Now you do it. Emulate that. Right? Several times Paul says, follow me as I follow after Christ. Right? Three times I think he says something like that. Twice in 1 Corinthians and once here in Philippians. <clears throat> so we ought to do what God wants us to do, live as a child of light. Okay, So that's what we talked about last week in Ephesians chapter 5. Okay, before I move on, <laughs> we got to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is our gospel, and I can't escape talking about this at least a little bit. Uh, this is the gospel of the uncircumcision that he talks about here. 1 Corinthians 15, of course, many people go there, uh, verses 3 and 4 specifically, that succinctly say how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel that was given to Paul. Very simply, the cross set us free. If you believe in what Jesus did on the cross, then in that very moment of faith, the Holy Spirit will baptize you into the body of Christ and you are at the liberty to do whatever you want. (laughs) You are sealed by God's Holy Spirit under the day of redemption, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 talk about. Uh, You cannot be separated from God's love through Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 38, 39. You're there. We're going to be in heaven. We're going to be in the presence of God, I should say, uh, forever and ever. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, it says, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. And don't get me wrong, you can learn a ton of good truth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He does, Jesus is the very image of God. So we can learn things from there. Uh, But we also need to get beyond that uh, because Christ is risen. Christ sent Paul, and now we know him no more as his earthly presence only. Hopefully that makes sense as well. We don't know him that way anymore. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. This is our vocation. If you have a King James Bible, that's what it says. Or your calling, the call. What are we called to do? Share the message of reconciliation. Hold forth that word of light. Okay? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Um, Where was that? Verse 18, all things are of God. Oh, I just read that. Verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. This is part of our identity now in Christ, that new creation in Christ Jesus created unto good works, Ephesians 2.10. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Okay, so in Christ, we have his righteousness. And this thought came into my head how I get a little uh, irritated when someone says, you have to get right with God. There's only one way, and you can't get more right than his righteousness. Okay? When you trust in that gospel... That Jesus' blood paid for your sin on the cross of Calvary, you're already right with God. There's nothing you have to do. There's things you ought to do and things you ought not to do. Okay? But there's no real requirement. But I always ask the question, why not? What is holding us back from being all in, head over heels, into Christ? Making the most of what we can every day, preaching, sharing the gospel, especially in this dark holiday season that we're in. And when people are actually out there visiting neighbors, 
Most people I know stay at home behind their screens all day, right? But today is a day where people finally venture out. So we may as well make the most of that. Most of what I just said was not exactly planned for this morning. <laughs> I had full intention of getting down from verses 4, like down quite a ways actually, uh, to 24. So, Philippians chapter 2. Now, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, remember who holds all the authority. Right? That's what fear and trembling is all about. He's got the power, remember I cited uh, Luke 12, 1 to 5. God himself, God the Father, has the power not only to destroy the body, but after that, cast into hell cast into the lake of fire, cast into Gehenna. That's what it says there. Okay, so he has that authority. He's going to be on that great white throne. And I've made analogies for us to comprehend at least a portion of this, how uh, when we were in school, most of us can relate to that. You know you did something wrong. The teacher says, what did you do? Or he's calling you out on that. You get that fear and trembling feeling going on, don't you? Or when you're at home and your parents caught you doing something you shouldn't have done. Same thing. Right? When that authority says something like that, catches you in that moment, that's that fear and trembling, isn't it? Well, God has that authority, and I didn't go there in 2 Corinthians 5. It talks about appearing before the Bama seat of Christ. We're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of what we've done in the body. Anyone got that fear and trembling inside? <laughs> I did when I like, read that for the first time. Like, whoa, really? I better do what I should, according to the Bible. Right? So that's why I want to encourage us. That's why you see so much encouragement to live a godly life in, especially Romans through Philemon. Peter talks about it too. How ought we to live then? Right? He says it too. Uh, but that's what we should be striving to do. Hey, I'm not going to dwell on that this morning again. So it's God that worketh in you both to will, that means to desire, and to do of his good pleasure. God's going to put it upon your heart to do certain things in your particular ministry because you are a valued member of the body of Christ wherever it is that you're at. Okay. Verse 15, he says, or 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. One of the hardest commandments I always say to follow because we always want to grumble and complain, don't we? Yeah. Um, so he says, do it without murmurings and, and disputings. Why? That you may be blameless and harmless or unblended, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That's the Greek term genia. I hope you don't mind me replacing the word nation in there. Uh, <clears throat> unless you think of that nation meaning the whole world. I guess I could see that. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Verse 16, holding forth the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And this was what I was going to focus on this morning. Is that attitude of Paul and the response of the church in Philippi. When he says, I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Think about their interactions in the church of Philippi. How, church, how Paul had entered in, and I think this is the account in Acts 16, he met Lydia by the water there and where they were praying and, and came upon this church here in Philippi, and he expounded unto them the gospel of the grace of God in some way, shape, or form. Okay? But he labored and labored and labored. As was Paul's way, he would expound scripture. He would go through it in this he knew way more scripture than I do even today, and I, you know, I'd, I'd study like crazy. As much as in me is, I try to learn the words of God rightfully, exactly what they say. It's my goal. Okay? But even with that, Paul could quote things off the cuff, it seems, or probably recite whole books. I don't even know. But he just, all this stuff comes to his head. And you can imagine all this labor of teaching them. Here's the beginning. Here we are right now. Here's what's coming, just like what I've talked about too, or other preachers also. And talking about the prophets, how Jesus is the very of Christ, very Christ, proving from Old Testament scripture all these prophecies. You can imagine now he tells them, but now you couldn't be justified by any of those works. You're justified by faith in Christ. Right? Like we talked about, I think that was last week when we went to Acts 13, uh, when he gave that message, his first recorded message, how it literally says there, all the Gentiles besought him that they may hear again of this word. Because it's a stark difference. Before that, there was, they would be quoting Old Testament. They'd be quoting law stuff, how we have to do this under these burdens. You can imagine whatever they might have talked about there. But now here comes Paul says, you couldn't be justified by that. You can be justified by Christ alone. Gentiles went nuts, didn't they? They were like, oh, this is awesome. And they told everyone and their brother, to borrow today's vernacular, because it says in the next few verses, the whole city came to hear. 
right? And how I wish there was that sort of response today anywhere, uh, but here we are. There are out, people are out celebrating death instead. It's just the way of the world. <clears throat> I had a point of going there. Okay, so he's, he's laboring to teach them scripture to help them understand now their identity as that new creation in Christ Jesus. This is who you are. And when you understand that identity and that God is going to work in you both to give you that desire and to work it out, that good pleasure, how, how they should now go for it. Don't quench the spirit, but walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Okay, so they may be blameless and unblended or harmless, it says, having that sober mind, clearly focused, rightly divided in the word of truth, understanding it as it is. He comes around saying that I have not labored in vain. It's the dream of any teacher, any parent, I would wager, out there when you're discipling or rearing children that the end goal is for them in the case of parents to children the end goal is for them to be fully functional independent adults they can take care of themselves and and, and live as they should that's the goal we don't want them to remain as children till after they're 35 i think that was the last one that i saw last article news article that was years ago when they said this is the new adolescent age 35. <laughs> no way. <laughs> that is insane. But it's teaching people to be lazy, become busybodies, and that's something that the scripture talks against. Don't do that. Work for your own bread, like it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, or chapter 3, I should say. Uh, but that, you know, that's what the world is going to teach. Uh, it's not going to teach the same things that, that the Bible teaches. So anyway, the point, the desire of a parent is to bring that child up to their own full, mature independence. The desire of any teacher is to teach their students so that they can become wise and, and understand that particular topic. And if they're a really good teacher, desire them to seek it out and be even wiser than they are. Right? That's the whole goal of, of discipling. I think that's the best term I can give. And so when he says, uh, I, that I, holding forth that word of life, that you may be blameless and harmless, that I have not run in vain. Because he's... He's discipling them. He's filling them with this not the knowledge of the truth, and his goal is for them to stand out as children of, of God, right? That he says they're the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Stand out. Have that, hold forth that word of light. <laughs> word of life, that's what I thought, 16. Holding forth that word of life that he can rejoice in the day of Christ. And remember that day of Christ, he mentioned that back in chapter 1, verse 6, that he is confident of this very thing that he, God, which hath begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Remember, he created any believer, he created us in Christ Jesus unto good works that we should walk in them. That is God's desire for us too. Right? God's will is to get saved, come unto the knowledge of the truth, and then behave like a child of God. Not to behave like the world anymore. Rejoicing in the day of Christ. Think about that too. Why do we do what we do? Why do we preach the word of, uh, of reconciliation? Why do we just willingly help each other out when we don't have to? <laughs> just brings up the mentality of the workplace. Most people will say, that's not my job. I'm not doing that. But the Christian typically is like, no, that needs to get done. Let me help you. For no really other reason other than, here's a job that needs to get done. I want to serve. Right? That's the attitude that we read in. Philippians, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. We're, and we're here, we serve one another out of love because that attitude was in Christ Jesus. He loved the world, for God so loved the world, that one just came to my head, that he gave us his only begotten son. Right? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commended his love toward us in that. <laughs> we kind of mixed up that verse there, but that's what I was trying to get at. So that day of Christ, you think about how awesome that day is going to be really want us to be heavenly focused. Right? Colossians 3 says to set our affections on things above, not on the earth beneath, because our life is in Christ. It's hid in Christ. <clears throat> and, yeah, okay, I'm not going to try to keep quoting that one. But think about that day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. How awesome is it going to be to see in the paradise scenario, <laughs> I'm having trouble trying to describe this, as most people just say, in heaven, uh, but in, with, in the presence of God, how great is it going to be to see all these 
lives, all these souls that you particularly touched. And likewise, those that touched your life. And I'm not even saying that you had a physical interaction with. I've gotten so much truth out of men that have been long dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just because they wrote them some things down for the purpose of circulating it, sharing it, here's my study, here, grow from it. How awesome is that day of Christ going to be? And this is what we labor for, right? This is those good works. We're doing these good works, not for our own glory, but to bring glory to God and edify the church. Okay. Then we get to verses 17 and 18, where he says, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also ye do, do ye joy and rejoice with me. I actually got stuck on these verses trying to comprehend the full meaning of it. If I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Uh, I had to look at the Greek, of course, and I just have to joke about this one. If I be offered comes from the Greek term spendo. I'll give you three guesses to what English word would be the equivalent, but the first two don't count. <laughs> I'm spent. I am spending myself. He's pouring himself out. The Greek term has the idea of a, uh, a libation or that um, drink offering. Okay, so he's pouring himself out, sacrificing himself so that I am spent. Right? How many times have we said that in our lives? Usually from some physical exertion or even, like my day job sometimes, mental exertion, trying to put everything into place where it should go, uh, keep everything in order. Right? Sometimes your brain gets fried. That's another <laughs> phrase that people use today. I'm spent. Can't do it. It's the same kind of phrase here. If I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. If I am spent upon you uh, for your service so that now you're going to be acting in Christ, awesome. Right? And that's really the joy of all of this. And just to go further, that Greek term spendo is only written here and in 2 Timothy 4, 6. Uh, you can check that out on your own time, but that's when he says, I am uh, ready to be offered. Uh, I have finished the course, fought the good fight, fought the fight of faith, or kept the faith. I'm mixing and matching some verses there. But you can look at that. That's the only other time that word spendo is found. Service here is liturgia or the English liturgy. It's not as easy when you hear it, but when you see it, yeah, it looks like liturgy. So that's their service. It's that, uh, that communal service. It's, it says, in, according to Strong's, like a priestly service, sacred ministering, uh, but it's for like, a communal service. Okay? So Paul had serviced this church in Philippi. He was spending himself there, investing in them as the apostle to the Gentiles. He was sharing with them the message of reconciliation and got to partake with the joy of the community of those in Christ. And back in chapter 1, verse 7, he witnesses and says, you are all partakers of my grace. What a joy it is to be with you all. You trust in this, now, now get the right attitude and act like it. Or rather, he's reminding them of who they ought to be. Because you remember, all of this talk is leading up to, it's like, what, two verses there in chapter 4, where uh, he says... Well, really, verse 2. Uh, I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind of the Lord. So there's some sort of argument, some sort of discord going on here in the church of Philippi. Not uncommon. People just have a hard time getting along. I like to call it intense fellowship or butt heads. Right? But it's just what happens in this flesh. And yet, he's reminding them, be of the same mind. I know there's disagreements, but we're all in Christ. And we are all one body. We're all partakers of the same grace. And Paul's desired outcome, of course, is that he neither run in vain nor labored in vain. And if he be totally spent with them, he can rejoice and they can rejoice with him. Okay, so it's this communal service between one another. And I wanted to end this morning. Okay, I did make it. So praise the Lord. Uh, verse 19 in chapter 2 of Philippians. He says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. But as you know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served me in the gospel. Him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. 
Now these verses, to me, are pretty self-explanatory. However, what I wanted to end this morning on is the witness of Timothy. And if you look again here, he's sending Timothy to Philippi to know the state of them, uh, sending him to hear of all their affairs, where they're at, how they're doing. Uh, But he says, I have no man like-minded, in verse 20, who will naturally care for your state. Then he witnesses those in the flesh. For all seek their own, not the things of Jesus Christ, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But Timothy's witness is he's going to naturally care for them. That's a 180 degree difference from verse 21. And verse 22, he says, but you know the proof of him. So he's not just saying this. You know the proof of him, that as a son with the father, he hath duluo, or doulos again, slaved, served, with me in the gospel. So he, he, he went, waited on him, you could say, hand and foot. He was just all in, totally committed. And this is the witness of, of Timothy. And when I come across something like this, when you read about these witnesses of particular people in the Bible, yeah, this is one of those things that triggered in my mind. Somebody asked me this long ago, before I really knew hardly anything in the scriptures. What kind of witness do you want to leave in this world? And that really made me start to think. What kind of witness do you want to leave in this world? And when you read something about this, like Timothy, Timothy was a young guy. He was frail. He had oft infirmities in his stomach. So I can really relate to this guy. But he really loved the Word of God, loved the Lord, loved the fellowship of the saints. So you get that kind of idea. He probably looked something like me, this frail kind of guy, uh, but was just totally all in to serve one another. And so again, that when I started reading through this and preparing for this week, that I don't even remember which saint that was anymore that talked about this long ago. I said, what kind of witness do you want? So I want to present that this morning. What kind of witness do you want to have in the world? And imagine this too. Someone later on, a different person, said, if your name was written in the Bible, what would you like God to write about you? Something like this? <laughs> Or perhaps something like Demas, where he says he loved the present world and left it. Totally left the gospel of the grace of God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, you can look at that. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, I believe, is when Demas is greeting the saints. But by the time you get to 2 Timothy chapter 4, he's like, I'm done. He threw in the towel, so to speak. And I've seen, unfortunately, people, saints that have done that too. I still don't doubt they're saved in Christ because they still proclaim Jesus Christ died for their sins. But they've started embracing another gospel, another doctrine, and start teaching that, which is really confusing because they were starting off following after Paul as he followed after Christ, but it can happen. Demas was proof of that, and now there's contemporaries with us that do that same thing. I had many other scriptures to go off of. But again, to point out the difference of the mental attitude, verse 21 here in Philippians 2, all seek their own things that are not the things which are Jesus Christ. Again, a total contrast to Timothy's attitude, but also to what we read in verses 5 through 8. Right? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He served to the uttermost. And I want to encourage us that we all can have that kind of witness of God. Now, if you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, First Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, Paul presents his witness to them and his how he behaved himself. Let's put it that way. Uh, starting in verse 1, it says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So he's talking about his imprisonment in Philippi there, not that the church was mean to them. Uh, Verse 3 says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor cloak of covetousness, God is witness. 
And I'd like to have that witness too. <laughs> I'm not hiding anything, no cloak of covetousness. I really like that phrase for some reason, very poetic. But uh, there's, not, there's no hidden agenda, if you want to use today's vernacular. Verse 6, he says, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gen gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her child, her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. You know, Paul was spent in more than one place. Let's put it that way. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And as ye know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. There's that maturation, encouragement, exhortation again. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And I want to at least read that verse uh, to encourage us to be filled with the word of God. It will work in us. There's black and white what it's going to do inside of us. And how Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, how they behave. We can all have that witness. And I'm trying to encourage us to have that witness. Uh, okay. Uh, if you turn with me now to 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm going to try to wrap things up here. Second Timothy chapter 2, we'll begin in verse 8. And if you want to put a finger in 1 Timothy 4, I'll be there after this. Okay. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. He's writing to Timothy, saying, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So there's that again. Where I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, or if we are faithless, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things, Put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. There's a lot I could read about this, but I'm really trying to get some context for the latter part of this passage. In verse 15, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I'm kind of digging myself in a hole. I don't think I can do all these verses justice in a couple of minutes here. But the whole idea here is to purge all of that stuff, right? All those errors concerning the truth. Paul pointed out a couple of them who talk of a resurrection, but then say it's already passed. You missed it. Too bad. So sad. And who knows what else they're saying. But what God says in verse 16, that it will increase into more ungodliness. My whole point of coming through here is really just to get to that verse in verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use. And I hope that all of us desire to be that vessel. And prepare it unto good works, or meet for the master's use. That, that God will work in us effectually, 
bringing us unto the knowledge of the truth, and that now we have no more error in our doctrine. I think that's the whole idea of what I'm trying to get across this morning. He goes on there to say, flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender stripes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. That's kind of a scary thought when you think about it, but that is the reality of the spiritual wickedness that we are contending with in the heavenlies, according to Ephesians 6, 12. But I want to encourage us to keep on, right? Keep on keeping on. Be the man or woman of God that you are, that we are, I'd include myself in this, to be meat for the master's use. <laughs> now purge of all the, the unsound doctrine and, and study to show yourself approved unto God. And in 1 Timothy 4, uh, verses 7 and 8, this is a, the, past, the couple of verses I sometimes joke about, even though the, what I say is true. Uh, it says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness, in other words, living godly, which will make us suffer persecution, according to 2 Timothy 3.12, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. And this is where I joke and say, those that live godly, the rewards are out of this world. Uh -huh. And so let's close this morning in prayer. Lord, I do thank you for the time that we are able to, to study your word. I'm thankful that, that, that we can know your word works effectually in those that believe, those of a sincere heart, bringing us to maturity in the faith, helping us to understand our identity in Christ and to live appropriately. May we all have that goal to... Uh, live in such a way as a child of God that we may be harmless, unblended, uh, uh, that, that we would hold forth that word of life and others would see that difference of Christ in us, that hope of glory and desire it as well. Let all things be done for your glory. In Christ's name, 